this is not restless. Okay, I know you just want to get to the show, but I'm actually here to tell you that there's a way that you can get even more restless in your life. You can do that by going to patreon.com backslash the restless podcast, where there are three different ways, starting at just $3 a month, that you can both support this show and at the same time get even more content, at least one extra episode a week and often more. Not to mention the Restless Telegram channel that you'll have access to 24-7 to interact with all the other patrons. If you want more Restless in your life, this is the way. Go to patreon.com backslash the Restless Podcast. Okay, back to the show. Pastor Michael, it's that time again. It's time for a good faith Restless Podcast live stream how are you doing tonight i'm doing well we were just chatting a little bit about uh how i have no idea how this one's gonna go i have no prep like i have no i've not seen any clips i've not heard people talk about it um where the other ones i felt like i had a little bit of background nothing going into this one and so i think it will be uh fun to have this conversation with you um have this conversation with everyone else who will join us uh over the over the next hour and a half or so um and it may be horrible <laughs> i'll just say i am not super hopeful on the pgc guns debate uh that we are going to be viewing tonight and so i'll just say yeah i don't know i don't know how it's gonna go but tonight we will be watching tgc's debate um which they title gun control and the right to bear arms so we will find out who are the people in this debate. Hopefully we'll have some friends join us here on the live stream. We will be giving away one seven-day trial to the Patreon to someone who's not a patron joining us on the live stream tonight. Hopefully we get some people. Um, I am the host of the Restless Podcast, which is a postmortem on the young, restless, and reformed. And every other Monday this summer is a postmortem on TGC's good faith debates pastor michael tonight if your conscience allows the pills will pay the bills and we will have a good time um as we before we get going pastor michael will be at the presbyterian church in america's general assembly and if you send him a message he'd love to see you yeah so yeah if you're gonna be around in memphis tennessee we'll try to set up some kind of uh meetup for you know coffee or breakfast or dinner or drinks afterward or something like that um, so I know a few people have already reached out and um, anybody else if you uh, watch this if you listen to this and you're going to be there this coming week um, it would be great to see you and connect a little bit it was fun last year to, to see quite a few folks um, who were listening and so it'd be fun to fun to do that again and maybe do a little bit more uh, of a st- structured event <laughs> Yeah, well, it's going to be fun. I guarantee that. Uh, If for some reason you happen to be in Madison, Wisconsin this weekend, I'll be filling a pulpit there. So you can send me a message if we have a random listener in that area. Uh, I will certainly be eating that Saturday night at a uh, supper club. So you can can ask me if you're allowed to join me for that wonderful event I will be engaging in. So we're very, uh, we're really pumped for tonight. I don't know if I'm pumped. I, I really, as I told Pastor Michael before this started, I am very, very not hopeful for this particular TGC good faith debate. Pastor Michael, we're back in season one of the good faith debates. So the aesthetic is okay. So it'll be a little bit more somber. It's going to be a, um, it's going to be darker, no longer between two ferns. That's right. We've, it's interesting to jump back and forth. It is interesting. Uh, like we've been doing. It's kind of fun. All right. So let's just get it going. We only have an hour and a half. This thing's 52 minutes long, everybody. 52 minutes. And somewhere we have a patron who just screamed in agony when they heard that number. But this is what we're here to do. Here we go. Oh, yeah. I can't.
Man, which do you like better? Which feel? I don't know. All right. So, everyone, the question of the debate is, how should Christians think about gun control and the right to bear arms? Let me just say, wow, what a question. So, that is going to be tough. Pastor Michael, should we particularly... Um, should we mention any any baggage we might bring into this? Maybe the only thing to say is uh, we live in Wisconsin where <laughs> the general populace is going to be much more comfortable with guns than probably many parts of the country. Obviously, yeah, although both of us live um, either in or near uh, some uh, you'd call politically progressive mm -hmm. uh, cities in Wisconsin. Uh, but I do, I live in the country. Um, I have a farm in Wisconsin. I think that that should at least tell you a little bit about me. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, I am, I'm not a huge gun guy, by the way. I'm not like going to gun shows. Uh, I'm not like uh, stocking up a, a ton on ammo yet because I just haven't started yet, but I really should. <laughs> um, I, but I'm not like a prepper. I don't, I don't even know that much about guns. I've, you know, I've taken Hunter's safety, which was, you know, normal. Uh, and in, at least in this area, again, it's just normal right. for most people to have that. And yeah. I've been trained in other ways, right. In, in uh, different ways with firearms, but it's, it's minimal. I feel very comfortable with a gun. Um, I, I am not like a, I wouldn't consider myself like a gun nut, you know, like people will ask me, you know, I'll, I'll talk to somebody who is really into guns and, and they'll ask me, Oh, what kind of like, Oh, what kind of handgun do you have? What kind of this do you have? And I'll say, I think it's this, I, you know, I don't really know. Um, so that's where I'm coming in. I I'm very comfortable with guns. Mm -hmm. I'm not maybe, uh, uh, I don't think of myself as an extremist when it comes to, owning guns <laughs> yeah i i like i like most people including women and children in the state of wisconsin took hunter safety and i went through hunter safety with my family and i never intending me to probably ever actually use or touch a firearm in really any way uh beyond that but again it's basically something everyone in wisconsin does um i we are probably i i mean i literally don't know how you could easily answer this question in a helpful way so i'm sure tgc will do a magnificent job uh with this but yeah i mean i so i don't have a i don't have a comfort with guns i don't um but i think that that is um that is going to that is probably compared to a good amount of the wonderful people in Wisconsin I know. And so uh, I've been around guns. I've shot guns. Um, but let's uh, Michael and I have hunted together. That was a particularly uh, fun, fun endeavor on our on our part. We did. I, I forgot that we went hunting together, Matt. I hope I hope we can do it again. So let's get into this thing. This is a an interestingly an interesting question so we'll we'll see how it goes on february 24th 2022 russian troops launched a massive military invasion of ukraine in response <laughs> ukrainian president zelensky yep. posted this on twitter we will give weapons to anyone who wants to defend the country the right to bear arms is no abstract right and the debate over it is no ethereal debate if ever we needed a picture of how important the right to bear arms is, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has given us yet another one. What should Christians think about gun control and the right to bear arms? That's the question before us in this good faith debate. We should and the answer is simple. Pro -Ukraine. Because Jesus Christ commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves, Christians have a moral duty to protect every person's right of existence and of self-defense, which includes the right to bear arms. I will demonstrate this assertion in three phases. First, I will show biblically that human beings have a basic right of self-defense, or to say it another way, a right to preserve their own existence. Second, I will show that Christians have a moral duty to love our neighbors by protecting this right. And third, I will show that the right to self-defense in the modern world includes the right to bear arms. 
And thus, to defeat my argument, an opponent would have to show either that human beings do not have a basic right to preserve their existence, that Christians do not have a moral duty to love our neighbors by protecting that right, or that that right does not include the right to bear arms. To state my case another way, you might say this, the right to bear arms derives from the right of self-defense, which exists by virtue of creation. Organisms that exist have the right to preserve their own existence. And because loving our neighbors includes protecting their right to existence, we have a moral obligation to protect the right of self-defense in society, and that includes the right to bear arms. So let's start with a very simple fact. Organisms that exist have a right to preserve their existence. The preservation of life is a basic commitment of biblical ethics. And as organisms have a right to exist, so too they have a fundamental right to self-defense. The most important biblical text on this matter is Exodus 22, verse 2, which reads, If a thief is found breaking in and is beaten to death, no blood guilt is incurred. The pressing question is, why would an Israelite not be guilty before the Lord for killing a man during a robbery? Quite simply, because it's a clear case of self-defense. In the Talmud, the rabbis offer this commentary on the text. It's as though the thief was considered dead from the start. Here the Torah teaches, if someone comes to kill you, kill him first. Let me just say... The Bible and the Jewish common law tradition assume the basic right of human beings to self-defense. Any of the other... Greek and Roman law also recognize this basic right. The Roman orator Cicero, in a speech before the court during a self-defense trial, asked, What is the meaning of our swords? Surely we would never be permitted to have them if we might never use them. This, therefore, is a law, O judges, not written but born with us. If our life be in danger, every means of securing our safety is honorable. For laws are silent when arms are raised. The law very wisely and silently gives a man a right to defend himself. The great Thomas Aquinas also understood the right of self-defense to be a given. In the Summa, he writes, Inasmuch as every substance seeks the preservation of its own being, whatever is a means of preserving human life and of warding off its obstacles belongs to the natural law. In the Reformation tradition, Francis Turretin states the matter quite plainly. To repel by force and to defend oneself belongs to natural and perpetual right, even unto the slaying of the aggressor. So biblically, logically, and theologically, human beings have a basic right to exist and therefore a basic right to self-defense. Furthermore, Christians have a moral duty to love our neighbors by protecting and preserving this right for them. This is most clearly seen in the way the Protestant catechisms understand the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. The Westminster Larger Catechism asks, what are the duties required in the sixth commandment? And Shout it answers out to this Westminster. way. The duties required in the sixth commandment are all careful studies and lawful endeavors to preserve the life of ourselves and others, including just defense against violence. The catechism goes on to state the sins forbidden in the sixth commandment are all taking away the life of ourselves or of others, except we, in case of public justice, our, lawful war, yeah. or necessary defense. Your church plan. According to the catechism, the law of God enjoins upon Christians a moral duty to defend our neighbors against unjust violence and to preserve their lives by all means possible. This was Calvin's understanding of the commandments as well. Uh, he writes, each man ought to concern himself with the safety of all. We are accordingly commanded, if we find anything of use to us in saving our neighbors' lives, faithfully to employ it. If there's anything that makes for their peace, to see to it. If anything harmful, to ward it off. God's law commands us to love our neighbors by protecting their existence and defending them against unjust harm. So thus far, I've established that biblically, logically, and theologically, human beings have a basic right to existence and to self-defense, and that Christians have a moral duty to love our neighbors by protecting that right. It remains then to show that the right of self-defense includes the right to bear arms. If it is granted that human beings have a right to defend themselves and a duty to defend others, the only matter to be settled is 
what are we to defend against? And the answer is against violence to their person. On the playground, it may be the violence of a bully's fists. In Cicero's day, it may have been the violence of a Roman sword. And in our day, it includes the violence of modern weapons. We live in a world where guns exist. We may wish that wasn't the case, but it is. And in a world where guns exist, the threat of gun violence will also exist. If a bully attacks me with his fists, I can fight back and call for help. If a stranger picks my pocket, I can cancel my credit cards and replace my lost goods. But if an attacker threatens me with a firearm, my life itself is in immediate and grave danger. And therefore, the right and responsibility to defend life in the modern world includes the right to bear arms for the simple fact that one of the gravest threats to life in the modern world is the threat of gun violence. And this threat exists not only for individuals, but for churches and schools, as we've seen repeatedly in recent decades. Advocates of strict gun control laws would deny to human beings a defense proportional to the threat against them. They work to craft a world in which we face the threat of gun violence, but lack a proportional means of defense for ourselves and for others. And that violates both the right to self-defense that is ours by creation and the duty of neighbor love that is ours by redemption. Because Jesus Christ commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves, Christians have a moral duty to protect every person's right of existence and of self-defense, which includes the right to bear arms. In closing, let me speak briefly to what I think is the strongest argument for gun control in the modern world, and that is this, that we are better off to entrust the defense of ourselves and others to the government and to its agents. And that works well until the government and its agents become the threat. And history has no shortage of such cases. It's the reason the right to bear arms was enshrined in the English Bill of Rights of 1689 and in the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. During the debates around the ratification of the Constitution, the anti-federalists frequently warned that a powerful federal government could simply disarm the people and impose military rule. And so Joseph Story, an early Supreme Court justice, argued that the security of a free state included security against the tyranny of an overreaching government. Because governments and not merely individuals are prone to violence and injustice, the most biblical approach to guns and gun ownership is to enshrine the right to bear arms broadly across a society. Yes, that does mean that guns will be accessible to criminals. But it's also the only way to ensure that every individual maintains the right to defend themselves and others against violence, whether that violence comes from an individual or from a government. The scriptures promise us that one day, the lion will lie down with the lamb. That one day, swords will be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. That one day, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But until that day, the scriptures assure us that wicked men will continue to eat the bread of wickedness and to drink the wine of violence. Therefore, Christians should worship our Savior for laying down his life and becoming a sacrifice for us. But we may not sacrifice the lives of those around us by our refusal to defend and protect them. In this fallen world, Christians have a moral duty to protect every person's right of existence and of self-defense. And that necessitates the right to bear arms. Well, it's great to be with you. Uh, thank you for having me. There is a, a long... Oh, I said the man walking up to the microphone has a thick accent, making me pretty uninterested in his <laughs> opinion. So... Pastor Michael, Bob Thune, um, a Acts 29 pastor. Um, he's a... Uh, yeah, I was going to ask, where, what is he? Who is he? Omaha. What's his background? He's in Omaha. And so he's kind of... Good for him. ...close to us. So they found a Midwestern guy to come defend uh, uh, the right to bear arms. I did learn from someone in the chat, Pastor Michael, you have competition. 
the man's church has six podcasts pastor michael you are way behind not even <laughs> you need to you need to really jump on this so i'm working on it i'm working on it and and you, <laughs> and you like bob Thune, could start your podcast with don't worry everyone i have a very mainstream opinion and state your support for ukraine um I don't know. I don't think people are really doing that anymore. I think that I get. I guess that is passe now. Is that that what has happened? So, um, what sticking up for Ukraine? Yeah. Or it seems like people don't do that anymore. I think you're just in too many right wing, uh, you know, sides of the internet, Matt. I. <laughs> the truth is, I actually just have not. I have totally unplugged from the news, so I have no idea. Maybe people are. Obviously. Uh, that is not what we are talking about here. But Pastor Michael, this is this is pretty good. He did a great job. I was yeah, I was impressed. I, I felt like he did a generally good job. Um, I think part of his answer just betrays the fact that maybe this isn't exactly the kind of thing for the gospel coalition. Tell us uh, more. meaning just meaning that I mean he's he's making a case from uh, just basic uh, natural law principles and uh, working that out into the way it would uh, play out in a particular, you know, constitutional framework and why that is good. And I, it's, I guess I'm not against TGC doing that necessarily, but it does just seem like a little bit out of their wheelhouse, if that makes sure. sense. Um you know, when when you're trying to be the people that, hey, we're coming together around the gospel. Now, obviously, we know that's not what they are, right? We know that that's not them. It'll be interesting to see how they move forward, um, especially once the moderator gets in and um, whatever this next guy says, which God bless all of our Australian listeners. And we know that there are a lot of you and we love you guys. Uh, I have a feeling that he's not going to be too keen on guns. Yeah. That's when I... <laughs> When he sounds to me like he must be Australian. If he, if he comes, I could be wrong. If he comes from a continent where out with where there is not a single gun in a home, I don't. It's it it's it's potentially predictable where he may uh may land. But here's the thing: I do think I do agree with you, especially when we're getting into gun control and right to bear arms. We are stepping pretty far out from uh pastor michael he is from london just so you know not he's not an aussie so we'll uh is that worse is, is that worse? it also betrays hey i'm from wisconsin i don't know everybody's accent so I, don't, I just don't we'll see in london where they've talked about knife. i only heard a little tiny bit of it so yeah where they've had to talk about knife control <laughs> so i think um but i do think something that would be very helpful and this is, I'd be interested to talk to Bob Thune or anyone about this. I think Christians do need a, need help with thinking through self-defense, according to the Bible. Um, I think there's a lot of bad thinking. I think there's a lot of challenges to it. Um, but, but again, yeah. Well, even, I mean, even just in the, in the young, restless and reform world, um, you do have, I mean, on the one hand, obviously we had certain kinds of, of bravado, but it usually didn't come out in like gun culture. You know, it didn't, it wasn't really that kind of bravado. Um, but uh, a large portion, when you think about like the John Pipers and, and guys like this, a really enshrined uh, pacifism as like the way that you should handle yourself as a Christian at all times, in all ways, obviously, you know, everybody knows John Piper's famous for saying some pretty extreme things as yeah. far as not defending his family, his wife, um, if violence was being done to them because he doesn't know if the other, if the guy attacking them is a Christian, right? So like that's, that's the kind of thing that I guess I've come to expect from the gospel coalition world. Um, and so I was, I was really pleasantly surprised to hear from him. And I think you're right. I think you're making a good point. And so so I think we we've planned eventually to review those statements by John Piper. And so this is a good reminder to do so. Let us know in a in a message or on, in the chat if you would be interested in us doing this. Right. So he basically walks through an argument that humans, because of the value of human life, have the right to self-defense. And I would say even responsibility of self-defense and to defend others as they're able 
and therefore we should use every tool at our disposal to do so right um and so i think i think the only thing that he doesn't really um doesn't really handle he says so we shouldn't we shouldn't want strict gun laws and maybe people have a general idea of what that would mean but i was i the only reason i have this number on my mind is because i was listening to kevin DeYoung's audiobook on the ten commandments and he was mentioning how in human i was just reading that today matt yeah he was mentioning how in human societies we multiply laws right and so this idea yes. that god's law is not very restrictive um and he just mentioned off the top of his head that there are in the United States at the writing of the book, there were 20,000 federal laws about guns. And so this, this is, in my mind, the actual wow. difficulty of doing this debate in any way that's good. Who amongst us is informed at all? And what would constitute strict gun laws? Do we have them already? Is it, you know, there, there are the idea that um, I mean, right. I guess one version of strict would be they're completely banned, right? They're banned, you know, from every person that we have an Australia like law, but the, the challenge of it. And so I don't think he really answers that because, um, when we think about these tools for self-defense and hunting and other things, um, I do think that there are difficulties and difficulties that are faced in different places and, I do think in gun culture, it's very easy to look back at the time of like the founding when we just everyone walked through stores and into church with a rifle over their shoulder and think that mu we must there must be something wrong with us that we can't do that anymore. And maybe, but also those guns could fire one bullet and sometimes couldn't go through clothes and every other person had a gun with them. Right. And so. There are there are questions of society and custom that I do think if you really want to dive into this, and I'm not saying you should, um, yeah. that you that you do actually you do have to answer in some. Form. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's really complicated, in other words. Right. It's right. it is complicated. I feel like he did a pretty good job in uh, maybe showing that by working through. I mean, obviously, he doesn't have a lot of time, no. um, but. But um, he covered a lot of ground as far as, you know, kind of uh, the tracing some of the, the, you know, history of the debate of self-defense and just war theory and those sorts of things in the Christian realm. Um, you know, mentioning uh, just a, a wide variety of men throughout the, the Christian tradition on this. Um, and... Uh, gave a shout out to uh the you know westminster larger catechism and things like that uh so i mean he covered a lot of ground um he did touch on a couple of scriptures and uh so he he was trying to tie it into all that but even just in the fact that he did that and then comes to uh you know this particular way that this has played out in america in the modern day where we have guns um, this is, I think it shows us that this is so complicated, uh, because the modern expression of what defense would now look like or could look like, um, on top of the, just the, the difference in, like you're saying cultures, uh, the difference in, uh, potential, uh, government structures. Yeah. It's just a lot. I mean, it's, there's just a lot of things. Now, it doesn't mean I don't love talking about it. You know, it doesn't mean that I don't mind having a conversation about it. But it does mean that, I mean, it is it is complicated. Even, I mean, you just mentioned, hey, even right now um, in the U.S. where, you know, we're known for having so many guns, there are 20,000 gun laws on the federal books. When Kevin DeYoung's writing that book, my guess is that there's even more now. Right. And that doesn't include all of the state laws. That doesn't right. include a lot more, right? So, um, it just it just shows you that there's a lot of complicating factors. And usually this conversation is brought down to the bumper stickers, right? Like it's just, do you want everybody who hates the lives of other people to have guns or do you want to restrict it? 
Right. Um, and and what does that? And you're never given actually. A, what does that mean to right. actually restrict it? One of the commenters, a patron, pointed out that the the final step of the argument that I agree he made was that if you have the right to defend yourself, you have the right to the means to defend yourself, which I do agree with. Um, yeah. I do think, as I think about this, I actually think the reason, the actual problem, and the reason people feel like Christians often come across as pro-gun is the arguments against gun ownership end up violating a biblical principle. I'm willing to grant there's a ton of complication, but... Mm when we come back to the fundamental principles of defending others, defending life, these kinds of things, which are biblical, there aren't there. And those means change over history. What, what I find is when someone presents the reason we shouldn't, it usually ends up being some very bad biblical argumentation or yeah. violating something the scripture clearly teaches. And yeah. so, and so if we could get those out of the way, I would be willing to talk about, uh, like I would be willing to talk about like how we can defend others. And, um, I, I have, I have an example, um, from we've talked, so we've talked about this. I don't remember when this was, but I think even on the podcast, we talked once about, you know, when I think about, um, gun ownership, gun laws, um, I mean, where I live, I mean, I am not abnormal and I have a decent sized family and more guns than people people in my family, right? Like, I mean, we, we have quite a few guns. Um, if I lived in New York city and, uh, since we have some, uh, patrons who are either in or familiar with New York, we were having a conversation this week about, uh, on the patron chat that you can be a part of if you sign up for the Patreon. Uh, but we were talking about, there's, you know, somebody, uh, sent, I think Clara sent, uh, you know, uh, tiny apartment that was renting for like $2,400 a month. And it was, I mean, it was like a hundred square feet. I mean, it was just like, you know, it was tiny. And when I think about that kind of living, right? Like you're in a building with how many thousands and thousands of these tiny apartments. Um, and then like when you have that, that many people in such a small area, would I change my mind about how comfortable I am that everybody around me has guns available to them? I don't know. I'm, I don't know that I would, but I maybe would. I'm, you know, I'm willing to consider that in some locales, it may be for the good of everyone else, be reasonable to um, have certain kinds of restrictions. Um, but like you're saying, I've never heard that talked about in a reasonable way. I've never heard that discussed in a way that makes me think, oh yeah, you're not just trying yeah. to uh, impose some kind of totalitarianism on us yeah i this is again this is the issue with de devolving this to bumper stickers of we need to we want people to effectively defend themselves and have the means to do so but the truth is um the the answer it's again we act like it's an on off switch of every per man woman and child in this country conceals carry or doesn't right like th those are not where we're going. Uh, my parents, they've been trying a little bit of the snowbird thing. They were going to a pretty large church in Florida. And the church had a, uh, a meeting uh, with their members after one of the services. And they had the, the meeting because of this. They said, we know a lot of our members concealed carry. And they weren't telling them not to. They weren't, you know, they weren't trying to tell them if they could or couldn't. But they were saying, our church has a safety plan if something unfortunate were to happen and so we are asking you know so they gave instructions if you aren't one of the people involved we want you to get down and try and get out right because obviously the church needs to address that because if someone runs in with a gun and a hundred people start shooting that's a bad like that is a really bad situation oh man yeah and some of those people will have no like shooting a handgun just in case any of our listeners don't know this is actually a very difficult thing to do well and accurately the, we have been for those of us who aren't familiar and didn't grow up doing this we have been destroyed 
by action movies. I was thinking about this scene in a James Bond movie where he gets <laughs> tossed a gun and is firing the trigger with his pinky. <laughs> it's like shooting men at like a hundred yards. Like, and we've been destroyed in thinking like that is what it is. That is the experience of firing a handgun or any gun. And that is yeah. not. And so, so like that, what I'm saying is those are the kinds of conversations we need to have that are legitimate, right? Like a yes. very legitimate, practical conversation. Yes. So, all right. Uh, about I, how to do this. I, if, if this debater calls for a legitimate, practical conversation, we will call this the greatest TGC debate ever. And if he does go <laughs> with a UK accent, I, um, on our next live stream, I will drink a, beverage of christian freedom originating from the united kingdom probably a guinness to be fair and distinguished tradition of british people crossing the atlantic and telling the americans that they should lay down their guns um, and we're having this conversation just a few hundred <laughs> yards away from the capitol building and the presidential mansion get out of here you red coat <laughs> down two centuries ago so it's probably worth clarifying that my paper today this presentation is not motivated by a desire to get any of you to surrender your empire become loyal subjects of her majesty and give us back our tea although i would not be untoward that kind of thing but if anything it's actually motivated by a more serious desire which overlaps i think very closely with bob's which is a desire to save american lives particularly those who are most vulnerable in society rather than to take them now you all know the statistics i expect if you don't, a paragraph, if you'll bear with me. America is a striking outlier amongst rich, rich countries when it comes to gun deaths, and indeed homicide rates in general are significantly higher here than elsewhere in the, in the rich world. Over 100 people are shot and killed every day in this country. 25 times as many people are murdered with firearms than in other rich countries proportionately, and 28 times as many women are murdered with firearms in this country. Guns appear to substantially increase the total number of homicides. Last year, there were as many murders in Philadelphia as there were in England, in, although England has 30 times the population that Philadelphia does. And those deaths are disproportionately clustered amongst poor communities. African-Americans, black Americans are 10 times more likely to be shot dead than white Americans. One million American women have been shot at by a domestic partner. Firearms are the leading wow. cause of death for American children and so on. Now, I doubt there's anybody here who isn't, see, I hope there's nobody here who isn't seriously troubled by those statistics uh, and doesn't see them as a significant problem. The, the question, of course, is not, is that bad? The question is whether anything can or should be done about that, and if so, what it is. Australia faced that question in 1996. After 35 people were killed in a mass shooting in Tasmania, right. the government took robust action just, banning all semi-automatic and automatic forever. weapons. They imposed longer and stricter waiting periods and more rigorous licensing and storage restrictions. And they required a genuine reason to own a gun, which included hunting and target shooting, but did not include self-defense. Since then, the government has bought back one million semi-automatic weapons, halving the total number of gun-owning households in the country. The number of gun homicides has dramatically reduced in that time, and the overall homicide rate has halved. Now, I mentioned the Australian example because right, I'm a sort of squishy British guy uh, who probably doesn't have the moral authority to speak on these things to this audience. The Australian example also because Australia seems to me to share a lot of cultural traits with the USA, which European countries like mine do not. Australia, like America, has a low population density, dangerous animals, a legacy of hunting, a wild west, a popular culture of rugged masculinity. So a lot of cultural things which it has in common with the states, which might not be true in Britain, but it also has a tragic recent history of mass shootings. And interestingly, it shares with America a high popular support for tightening firearm restrictions. Of course, there are additional political and legal obstacles to reform in the US, which do not exist in Australia, but that won't trouble most people in this audience because uh, pro-life Christians in this country have a track record of advocacy for what they believe is right in the face of congressional intransigence or whatever. Now, my case today basically involves four claims, and I've already made the first two. I'm going to save the fourth one to the very end for fear of losing the audience. Um, I hope I'm reading it correctly on that front. But the first two claims I've made are these. One, gun violence is a massive and tragic problem which afflicts America far more than comparable nations and disadvantaged Americans significantly worse than anybody else. And that is a grievous injustice. That's the first claim. There's a problem. 
The second claim is that international examples suggest that this injustice could be reduced if tighter gun restrictions were applied. And domestic examples do as well, because regression analysis comparing US states has shown that greater restrictions are strongly correlated with lower gun deaths. Now, there's a lot of debate, unsurprisingly, about which drives which, but the correlation is itself interesting, I, I think. The third claim I want to make is that the benefits of tighter gun control, both for potential victims and for the communities in which they live and die, outweigh the limitations on personal freedom that they involve. As I said, I'll save the fourth one for later. Let's assume for a moment that no one here is proposing an absolute ban on all potentially deadly weapons for all citizens. Okay. So I don't propose a ban on carving knives. I don't propose a ban on baseball bats or moving vehicles, even though all three of them can be used to right. kill people and have been. There you go. I don't even propose a ban on hunting rifles or target ranges, both of which are actually legal in the UK and both of which I have used myself for what that may be worth. But on the other hand, at the same time, I'm going to assume that nobody here believes that there should be no limits on the potentially, potentially deadly weapons that a citizen can own. I would be amazed if anybody watching this thought that a private citizen should be allowed to own nuclear devices or cluster bombs or howitzers or VX gas on the grounds that a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. In other words, you have both extremes, and I don't think anyone's really at either of those positions. There may be some, but that's certainly not where I am. I'm pretty sure it's not where Bob is either. In other words, I suspect that most of us already believe that citizens have the right to bear some arms and that the right to bear other arms should be infringed no matter what the Second Amendment says and so on. And put differently, there's a spectrum with carving knives at one end and weapons of mass destruction at the other end. At the light end, we might issue a warning on the packaging or refuse to sell them to children, or restrict their carriage in public spaces, including the space in which I'm speaking now, in which guns are not allowed. At the heavy end, we would refuse anyone See. found making or owning one of those heavier items for, of domestic terrorism. And the rights in each case are not absolute. They're balanced with the right of other people to cut up their stake. Uh, that, that, in other words, that's why you're allowed to wear, own a carving knife. They all play baseball. But they're also balanced with the rights not to be blown to smithereens while walking home from the office. We think the benefits of using carving knives are greater than the risk of being stabbed by them. Meanwhile, we, find, we think that the personal freedom to own a Molotov cocktail is dramatically outweighed by the chance of killing or maiming an innocent person. Our assessment of where something sits on that spectrum, I think, is a function of lethality, how many, peop how, how many people it could kill, teleology, what it's designed for, and utility, what it's typically used for. I think that would be a way of grading the spectrum. Maybe we could talk about that in a moment. So let me ask this. On that spectrum, where would we place assault weapons? Machine guns, AR-15s, the sorts of weapons that Australia banned 25 years ago successfully. And I put it to you that when it comes to lethality, teleology, and utility, how likely it is to kill, what it's designed for, what it's used for, all of those weapons, the, the, sort of the weapons that are assault weapons, AR-15s or whatever, are very much at the heavier end of the spectrum. They are designed to injure and kill people. They're used to injure and kill people with appalling frequency. And in that sense, they're more like a Molotov cocktail than a baseball bat or a carving knife. So if implementing, say, Australian-style restrictions, which are not as tight as British ones, but if implementing the Australian-style wow. restrictions would halve the number of innocent people being killed by them, or even close to it, then that benefit should take precedence over the personal freedom to own them. And nothing I've said so far is uniquely Christian, you will have noticed. This is a, a common good argument that could be used in the public square, regardless of whether the audience is evangelical or even Christian, because many who make the laws are not. But my fourth claim is more radical. What's the fourth the claim is that Christians Australia, should oppose the use of deadly weapons on principle because we're committed to the way of Jesus, the way of the cross, the practice of nonviolence. Followers of Jesus should oppose the use of AR-15s or machine guns in self-defense for the same reason that we should oppose landmines, drone strikes, capital punishment, abortion, you name it. Christians should never kill people. That's a tricky case to make in 60 seconds, but here goes. Jesus never used violence against people, whether to defend himself or to defend the innocent. He teaches his followers to live the same way, not resisting evil and turning the other cheek, Matthew 5, Luke 6. Every time a disciple tries or threatens to use violence in the Gospels, even in defense of the innocent, Christ rebukes them. Luke 9, Luke 22, John 19. The apostles regularly present Jesus' suffering as an example for believers to follow, 
Romans 12, Philippians 2, 1 Peter 2. Disciples are commended for joyfully accepting the plunder of their property, Hebrews 10. Our struggle is not with worldly enemies or worldly weapons, Ephesians 6. Christians conquer not by killing, but by dying, by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and not loving our lives even unto death, Revelation 12. And every church father before Constantine who addressed the subject, Oregon, Tertullian, Cyprian, Lactantius, Athenagoras, agreed that killing image bearers of God is always morally wrong. Now, I'm not naive. I know my audience will almost entirely disagree with me on this, and that's fine. But be that as it may, there is a strong common good case for tighter gun controls in America, perhaps along Australian lines, which just war advocates could happily support. The stakes are high. During this debate we're having, 10 Americans will be shot and killed during this brief... I apologise, shot during this brief debate. They won't all be killed. In Britain, we average one gun death per week. And the reason why I submit to you is encapsulated by Hilaire Balloch uh, at the end of the 19th century, and albeit writing in a very different context. He said, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. Thank you. All right, Pastor Michael. Oh, By the way, boy. we are the chat right now, just so you know, the, the chat wants to own tanks and uh, F-16s and warships. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you. I knew there'd be some. There I know, <laughs> I know there's always like those, that side of things that's like, uh, you know, well, you wouldn't want to own a nuclear weapon. I'm not against it. <laughs> that's what that's what I there, thought we'd get from at least some. There is an there. eagle. There is an awesome. eagle. You guys are bearing an American flag flying through our chat for these people right now. So, Pastor <laughs> Michael, here it's hard not to when you get somebody who's like, "Listen, I'm from a a radically different place. Let me tell you why what you're doing is completely wrong." Um, it's, it's hard not to be defensive, right? And and, and I'll try that, not to. I, I think we should try not to be. Yes. Yes. And that there is this idea that, like, if you're going to, to make me be consistent, I'm going to be consistent <laughs> in probably a way you don't like, right? Yep. Um, but again, I think that the, the issue in the end of the day is that we're dealing with the sinful reality. We aren't dealing with perfect outcomes. Um. So, yes, I mean, but here's the problem with his presentation. He does what I said. The problem with the yep. the strong con of this of this uh, position does is they violate certain biblical principles in their argumentation. Yes. Um, so well, I actually, and, yeah, oh, I'll let ahead. you you keep going, but I'll jump in there, too. Yeah, I'm not going to go to that. I'm going to say, in my opinion, the strongest possible case for uh that he started with is the idea that would we agree to severely limit firearms if it would truly save x number of lives yeah right man i i just um you might not be persuaded by that i definitely hope that that is at least a compelling idea to you yeah right like that if if this is what yeah it's you don't want to be so like uh you don't want to be so defensive and so i know that um for those who are uh who feel like they've like had people attacking this particular right and they feel like they have to push back that it's going to be easy to um in a sense become cold and indifferent to what are legitimate concerns, um, to what are legitimate injustices, um, things that really are uh, bad. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to shut that off. And so you're, you're right. I think um, we should be willing, if it were true, um, that this would actually be of benefit to your neighbor, should we at least consider it um, as an option? I think that's, that's at least a compelling argument. And even if we don't, um, even if we wouldn't end up agreeing on what that would mean, that is like a thing a thinking, caring person could try and conclude. Like if they yep. genuinely believe that, right? Um, yes. Now, of course, the problem becomes 
in all of in in all the way this gets worked out in what he's saying. So I, you had something you were going to jump on. I'm going to I'm going to jump on the potential problem even with the data. Uh, oh, the data is a mess. I mean, it's we can go down that road. I have so many different uh, ways that I would want to oh. take this. I guess I, I think. By the way, I think one of the arguments that is a little bit more compelling is that idea of, hey, there's a spectrum where we all agree that there are some limits already on what we should do, what is reasonable, what individuals should have um, the right to. Um, And I I do actually think, so what I would, what I would say more so is what is compelling at all about this kind of argumentation. And when you get it, like when he mentions actual data or says AR-15s and machine guns right together, making it sound like he maybe thinks they're the same thing. Yep. Um, it all falls apart to me. Like I, I all of a sudden do not believe that you're actually a legitimate thoughtful person on this topic. And so I don't really feel like I need to listen to you at all. In, in other words, you are just spewing, uh, spewing, I should say, uh, these talking points that you've heard, right. but you don't actually know and have a grasp of what's going right. on. Uh, but one of the things that some of the things he said do po- does point out is that, and I think we're seeing this more and more um, in our country, is that freedoms are for the responsible, mm. right? Freedoms are for a moral and religious people. Mm. This is something that all of our founding fathers believed. This is something that everybody would have agreed to. Um, freedom is not something that is suited to everyone. And in an increasingly depraved and degenerate culture, freedoms are going to be not just abused, but like freedom is not actually good for that kind of a person. And so I think that's something that we should keep in mind um, that freedom is good, right? I mean, it is good. It is, it is a a good thing in and of itself, uh, but it's not a good for those who are not good. It's not a good for those who are not like a, a, a people that is, Uh, is degenerate, a people that is completely um, captive to their vices, is not a people that can wear freedom well or use it well. And it's going to end up in a lot of in a lot of problems. Um, But the heart of that is not the, the problem there is not the freedom. The problem is the people that have that freedom. And so I, I mean, I tend to think that that will mean that our people being more and more degenerate will probably lose more and more freedoms because I, it just is what is going to happen um, with that kind of a people. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll let you jump in now and uh, then I can maybe share yeah. a bit more of, let me go to that. Let me talk about this. Then let's go to the data. Um, also, if you are not a patron patron and you are in the chat right now, please uh, just uh, uh, send a send a message in right now because we're going to pick one of you and we'll give you a seven day free trial to the Patreon. So I do agree with you. I think that's actually a very interesting way to go about this, that freedom and anarchy aren't the same thing. And one is a beautiful, amazing thing. And the other is a judgment from God that we should all fear. Yep. Right. And I think sometimes when we talk about in, in the colonial times, like you could own a cannon, like you could own a warship, like you could own these major, like these, all these tools, if you were wealthy enough, you could own these things. Right. And so, but that is very different than just saying like, yeah, I want like everyone to be able to basically park whatever they can and figure like one of those, the culture, the people is, uh, is a, internally regulated people and one is not right yep like a post-apocalyptic hellscape you can own whatever you want that's not a good place to live and no one should be pushing want a society that would look more like that right um and so again this is why this is such a you know obviously he made he said the one thing i agreed with he said nothing i'm saying is particularly christian i agree totally Yep. Um, (laughs) The other thing is, man, here's the deal. You can talk to me about crime. You can talk to me about the problem with guns. At the end of the day, the internal regulation of the Holy Spirit is our only hope. 
Yeah. This is the job of the church. And and guess what? If you want to be a person owning firearms and you believe you can help your community by carrying a firearm, I that I agree that might be true. You need a lot of self-control. You yes. need a lot of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I'm getting at is even as I think about um, the nature of these things um, is that like, I mean, if you, here's an example. Um, I uh, disciplined one of my sons recently because he acted out in anger and hit his brother. Uh, now, I mean, my kids wrestle. They're really rough with each other. They're tough kids. Um, I'm not against them, you know, hitting each other a little bit, but this was a distinct, he sinned and acting out of anger, hitting his, his brother very hard, I think with a toy or something. So he had to be disciplined and we were talking about it. And, you know, we talked about the nature of self-control. Um, I wasn't just lecturing my young child, you know, but we did just have a little conversation. I just asked him things like, you know, uh, about why he did it and, and, uh, what it was like. And I told him like, one of the reasons we need to do this and you need to learn, uh, self-control is because what happens if instead of that toy, you had a hammer in your hand and you hit your brother with that on the head, you could have really hurt him. Um, uh, what, what happens if, and I said, like, what happens if you had a gun, right? You would kill him, right? Because you're, and so if you don't have that self-control, um, you're going to be in trouble. And so we prayed uh, together and he was disciplined and um, he was disciplined very quickly first. And then we prayed after, by the way, I, <laughs> I didn't let it make him sit through a lecture and then, and then discipline it. But uh, I'm saying that to say, this is where a lot of this breaks down is you're coming at it from a purely humanistic lens. Hey, look at these ways that we could just, solve these problems by taking away this weapon. Um, it's not going to solve the problem because there are still people with weapons. This is maybe this is where we could get into some of the data. Um, I, I'm not going to give you like, you know, links to all this. I'm sure that you can find it. But I can tell you um, that Philadelphia has a lot stricter gun laws than where I'm from. Right. And yet he's talking about how, oh man, like look at how bad it is here. Well, how come the stricter gun laws aren't helping there? Whereas if you look where I live, there's not near as much gun crime. Every major city in this country with incredibly strict gun laws has more gun crime yes. than virtually everywhere else with looser gun laws. Yes, okay. and that's where it all falls apart. Like it's when you hear that, when you know that, and he says that, you see that either he is ignorant or he's misusing data. This is why Mark Twain said there's three kind of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Because even, do you know how hard it is to do actual statistical analysis on these things? Like to, to, so actually, right. to actually think through why Philadelphia has more gun crime than Stockholm or whatever. Yep. Also, even the idea that we can just compare America to the UK to Australia, America has minimum 10 times the people of these countries yes so many more people way more diverse place yes. way more different cultures within its bounds there's so many differences that like to just compare them like look other wealthy countries are like this right well you know what does that what does that even mean how many places in the u.s if you took them on their own would be considered wealthy countries in that, you know, in that comparison, I don't know. Uh, there's just so many ways that you could, you could twist that, right. that it's not even a helpful, it's not a helpful, there, there are statistics that are helpful. That is not. Yes. I also think um, when he talks about, you know, he's like, I'm not against, and, and even um, Republican politicians talk this way, you know, I'm not against all gun laws. People should own guns to be able to hunt or target shoot. Um, and he said, but in Australia, it's an, it is not a legitimate reason to own a gun for self-defense. That's where I, I mean, I just think we need to abandon that. We need to stop yep. saying we don't want total gun control for hunting and target shooting. Like if this is a tool for self-defense, then I'm, then I'm pro it. And, and I actually think, yeah, I think part of the force of this argument is the unfamiliarity so many people have with guns people like me like who do not feel particularly comfortable around a gun like 
I don't know if anyone in our chat or probably people listening, they feel like if they're around a gun, it's going to go off. Like that there's, it's just going to, something's going to go wrong, right? When that's what I think about when I think about carrying a gun. Now, obviously I don't feel that way about just having a gun in my home or shooting one, right? But that's how I feel, right? And do you know what? I don't know why, you know, this is this is what I mean when there are cultural things at play, because we don't feel that way about a car. Every single person in this country. Yeah. Most people on a daily basis use a deadly piece of machinery without much thought. Yep. Um, yeah. And and that doesn't mean you should do so without care. That doesn't make. You- and there are, by the way, there are way less way less deaths by vehicle in the uk right <laughs> i just i can i don't actually know that but i'm i'm like 99 percent sure that that's going to be the case right. um and th- so that statistic doesn't matter in that case right. right that doesn't actually teach us anything about vehicles and whether or not they're safe whether less people should drive um and it's it's the same thing when it comes to guns yeah and and so Again, when we get to this, especially when it was shocking, where he's like, and no one sh- should, and we'll come to this because we, the, 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 he makes three Christian statements, all of which are wrong. It's like, you know, yeah. it is the moment where it is like, it's amazing. I don't know how you were able to find a way to make everything you said wrong, but right. He talks about no Christian should ever defend themselves with a Molotov cocktail. Do you understand why mo- Molotov cocktails are used? Because you make them with things in your home. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, 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 let's ban Molotov cocktails. I mean, and this is where we get to the weird thing. Like, the the people who want Molotov cocktails have them, will have them, and still have. Like, this is not a difference, you know? Right. Uh, and yeah. And, well, and, and there too. Like, so there's a there's a kind of legalistic uh, assumption. Yeah, here we go behind all of this. Um, and it's what we had, it's what we talked about before. There's the assumption that the law itself will produce the kinds of people that won't do these things anymore. But that's simply not the case. That's simply not the case. That's not to say that law doesn't have some effect. Law does, um, it does constrict what you're able to do at times, right? It does limit it. Uh, But to think that it would somehow just drastically change everything overnight uh it just isn't the case yeah by the way the fact that he opposed uh capital punishment we can tee off on that in a moment we have someone i believe uh so so far graham fowler has announced he's not a patron and has put some interesting stuff in the chat so graham congratulations get in contact with us we'll get you a free trial to the patreon you got it man um so this is one of the legalisms it is. The, here's the one of the sentences he then said. Christians should not use an AR-15 in self-defense. This is where things get insane, my friends. Why? Right. Even the idea Christians should not use a Molotov cocktail in self-defense. Why? Yeah. Like, well, and also, what's the limiting principle? Why not? So I know, I know that this guy, being from the UK being the kind of guy that he made himself clear to be in his statements. Like he doesn't have any idea what an AR 15 is. And I'm saying that as somebody who has very little knowledge, right? I'm again, I'm not a gun guy. I I own some guns, but I'm not like, I'm not an expert on these things. Um, But to think that, (laughs) that I know that he doesn't know what he's talking about. right? Right. Like I, I know that he doesn't know what that is. Um, or what it does. And so then what is the limiting principle? Why did he choose AR-15? Well, probably because it's what's in the news, because it's a really popular gun, because people don't know better and they think, oh, AR, this must mean it's a a kind of, you know, assault rifle and it's it's a a fully automatic machine gun, which again, he put those two next to each other multiple times. And there's this assumption because you don't know, you just don't know what it is what it does, how it's used, how it's the most popular gun in the country. Uh, you don't know these things, so you assume a lot of bad. But if you then say, okay, well, you can't use that, you have to give me what the limiting principle is that says that that doesn't then affect 
uh, going hunting with a hunting rifle. Guess what? Most people use those for hunting. Right. So what? Where is that limiting principle? Where are you? Where are you stopping? Hey, maybe in the UK, when you go hunting, it's for very specific kinds of animals, right? Like it. Maybe you're hunting deer, right? Maybe you can use just a single shot rifle. What about somebody that's hunting a wild boar in Texas? Right. Does that change things for you? I don't know because you didn't give me any any principle on which to base what kinds of tools, which is what a, a gun is, right. what kinds of tools are not okay because of the damage they can cause and which are. Which are. Yeah. Right. The closest he got, by the way, was he said lethality, utility, and teleology, that these were principles that we can use to limit things. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's simply not uh, like that. That itself is not clear, right? right? That doesn't have actually clear guidelines. What, what? Let me actually give a limiting principle that I actually believe Christians should use when considering how to defend themselves. You should defend yourself with proportional force, right? You don't get to get punched and blow someone away, yeah. right? You don't get to be threatened at like you need to use. You can defend yourself with lethal force if lethal force is being threatened and used against you or someone innocent. Yeah. Right? Hey, oh. even by the way, um, the the first guy used the example from Exodus twenty two, right? If a thief breaks in at night, you can shoot him. You're not guilty of manslaughter, which brings up the point that there are m multiple times that God Himself has allowed for self defense, right? For killing somebody in self defense, and said it's okay. And and, and let's go further into that case law in Exodus 22, because it's very interesting. It says if a thief breaks in during yes. the day, you can't kill him. At night. You can kill him at night. Yes, right. I was. That's exactly what I was about to say. Why? <laughs> because of God's such a high principle on defending life, you don't get to um, fire on someone. You don't get to attack someone stealing property because they don't have the right to your property. They they should be caught they should be punished severely and if right? it's during the day there's a much better chance that you see them that there's a chance Understand. to follow them that you can figure out who it is right. if it's at night you don't know who it is you don't know what they have right. you don't know what their intentions are yes. and that's why it you know because the 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 priority is on the preservation of life then when it's not clear whether or not um, this person is going to seek to take your life. You have the right to defend yourself up to that That's level. Right. Um, but you don't have the right, by the way, to uh, kill that person and then go find their whole family exactly. and kill them. Right. It's not and just you get to do whatever. Vengeance is forbidden. Want. Vengeance is forbidden in the Bible. Right? That's right. right. The example to, to take that Exodus example into a modern day, it would be like the difference of me coming down my stairs and seeing a man breaking into my child's window, right? The force I get to use at that moment is different than if, crap, I see someone running out of my house with my laptop, right? I don't get to fire on that person in the back as they run away, right? That, that These are different things. Now, here's the other thing he said. Here's another really bad thing he said. Christians are never allowed to kill people are never allowed to kill people. Now, someone in our chat, Graham, who has won a, uh, a trial on the Patreon, mentioned he also opposed capital punishment. Because obviously, this is, and this is what beggars believe. You have to. Yeah, you have to. You have to be a radical pacifist. You know, like an extreme radical pacifist. It is, it is a shocking and extreme position to not think the Bible teaches capital punishment is a legitimate and God demanded punishment for certain crimes, Me, mainly and probably almost exclusively the taking of human life. Yep. It is repeated throughout the Bible, starting with Noah, you know, continued. We see in God's law to Israel, God tells them that they have the civil rulers who are not Christian in the testaments that they bear a sword to to bring god's wrath right this is an extreme position right if christians can't um kill anyone all the soldiers who fought in world war ii from the uk are in sin this is like this is a totalizing statement yeah. that under no circumstance 
can a Christian kill someone else? Right. This is, I mean, I just, I, I think it's shocking. And then the final one he brings up is he says, Jesus is teaching forbids any kind of what he called retaliation, which I agree with. Do you, but this is the self-defense and retaliation. <laughs> that is sneaky. That is sneaky. self-defense and retaliation. Aren't the same thing. No. Right. And what's interesting is when you read Jesus's words, I looked up one of the verses because it's this very, there's a lot of striking verses that Jesus says, for example, um, Oh, where'd it go? Come on. There we are. Nope. Okay. So Jesus says in Luke 22 at the end of his life, right? He knows the disciples are going to become outlaws. He knows they're going to be on the run. They're going to be on the move. And he says, but now let the one who has a money bag, take it. And likewise, a knapsack and let the one who has no sword, sell his cloak to buy one. Jesus instructs the apostles to buy swords at some point, right? It's interesting. There's this, there's this fascinating moment, right? In John's gospel, I believe where the disciples say, Jesus, look, here are two swords. They're at the last supper. And Jesus says, it is enough. Now, a lot of times people say, Jesus is saying, that's enough of any talk like that. I actually think what he's more naturally saying is, we have enough swords here. Why? Because Jesus, because his will was to be crushed by the Father, to die for sins, the disciples he was not getting a banded an army together. He was not raising a militia. Obviously, if they were raising a militia, they would need a lot more swords. They would need a, yeah. they would need to become a fighting band, right? These men are thinking like the Davidic king is here. It's time to be the Davidic band again. Yeah. But when Jesus tells them two swords is enough, one, they were laying around and they were with Jesus. Two, Jesus says you have enough. What would they have enough swords to do? That if they were in the open country and they were assaulted, they would be able to turn back attackers, right? They could defend themselves. Jesus is looking when he tells them to buy a sword. He's like, times are going to get so bad. You may be in positions where you'll have to find a way to defend yourself. Yeah. Jesus doesn't want that. Jesus would rather them have cloaks and knapsacks, but recognizes there are times where that is not the case, right? Mm. Um, yeah. Well, and also this... it. So it has to assume whenever you get these guys who are seeking this kind of extreme radical pacifism, which is that what's going on here? Like with TGC, as we're, as we've talked about how they're trying to decide, Hey, what's in and what's out. Um, the first guy was pretty straight down the middle, conservative, historic Christian understanding of, you know, the use of self-defense to preserve life. Uh, this guy's pretty extreme. And is that what's going on? They're kind of saying, hey, maybe we should allow these extreme guys as, you know, a legitimate a legitimate position, even if it's completely contrary to the vast majority of the Christian witness throughout history. Uh, but you have to have a radical uh, break in the testaments, right? Because you have to say uh, that there's nothing for us to learn from the fact that Abraham raised an army from among his men to go and to save Lot, right? E even though we are children of Abraham, we're heirs of Abraham, um, even though Abraham is held up as a, as a great man, right? You have to assume that that is so radically different and God is so radically different that that could never be done today in a way that is righteous, in a way that that is okay in the eyes of God. Um, and that's just something that I don't think that you can get to Biblically, right? You, you have to say, uh, basically, a, a few phrases of Jesus in the Gospels, like, like you pointed out, not even everything that Jesus says in the Gospels, but a lot of what Jesus says in the Gospels to his disciples, um, that's all we now right. have. We have to forget the rest of the scripture. Right. He also said, by the way, that Jesus um, never used I violence. Know which is true in his earthly ministry uh, before uh, he was, uh, before when he came to be killed, right? When he came for that purpose. Uh, but that's not the whole of Christ's right. work. That's not the only thing that Christ does. And actually the New Testament is full 
of references to the kinds of violence that Christ himself will carry out. Um, that is just and right. Not to say that we get to carry out the same kind of, of vengeance that the Lord does, but to say that, yeah, Jesus has nothing to do with violence ever is simply not biblically accurate. Right. This, uh, Yeah, totally agree. That was the thing that drives me. One of the things that drove me crazy. When Jesus returns, he will make the blood run through the streets as high as a horse's bit. Jesus has no problem with defending the innocent, righting wrong through justice and violence. Because that is what sin demands. Literally, when God instituted capital punishment in the Noahic Covenant, he's saying, this is what sin demands. Yeah, I demand this. Now, the other problem with this absolute view is, as a Christian, do I have the right to call the cops? Can the cops come and save me? Yeah, right, because what are they going to do? They're going to come and use violence to protect you if you are in trouble. Threat of violence. They're going to legally restrain someone. If I yep. did it, I was just at the park the other day with one of my kids, and uh, there was there had been a, a homeless man that somebody had maybe called. Uh, some maybe he had been uh, kind of screaming right next to this park with all these children, and and was just kind of causing an uproar. Um, and some police, and I didn't see any of this. I was not a part of this. I came later, evidently. Um, but a couple of police officers showed up. They came to me. They said, hey, is you know, have you, has this guy over here been screaming a bunch? And I was like, I, you know, I haven't seen that. I haven't been a part of that, but um, there were a bunch of kids at the park and they, you know, they came up and the police officers gave them stickers and uh, talked to him for a bit. And they, you know, one of the kids said at one point, well, what, why do you have a gun? Why, why do you have a gun? Um, and he, the, the police officer said, well, to keep you safe and to keep us yep. safe. And it was like a nice little interaction. It was kind of a, you know, an interesting little act, uh, interaction to watch. Uh, but yeah, that's what they're going to do, right? Like they're going to come with violence, uh, potentially to pr- like stand in the way so that they can protect you and use that violence against someone else. Uh, is that okay? Is it okay that you don't have to get your hands dirty so you can say, oh, well, I'm a pure, innocent, pacifist Christian uh, because these other guys have to go and sin on my behalf. Basically, Unfortunately, pacifist Christians end up being the kind of people that rely on other people to defend their life, property and freedoms. That's yep. the ultimate. That's where this thing always ends up falling apart is, well, I'm yep. going to be a pacifist because the cops have guns. Now, obviously, there is a difference between the state's right for violence and mine. Yeah. I don't have the right to go prosecute criminals, enact the capital. Like, I don't have the right to engage in the kinds of things they do. I'm simply saying Christians and individuals have the right to self-defense, right? That's very different than investigatory powers, all the kinds of things like, right, what the police were doing, right? If that's a public park um, and that uh, homeless man is acting wild, right, my duty is to help me and my family and others with me to go away, to move in the other direction, right? And call the police if I think it's it's a disturbance. I don't have the right to yank out a gun and try and get this guy out of the park or get a baseball bat or right. That's not my right. I don't have that right. That is what the that is what the state is legitimately there to do. Um now we gotta watch more of this debate because we have been doing this for an hour and 20 minutes and we just have their we're almost out of time and we're just, we've just been lambasting this guy I mean, and i have no problem with that by the way it was not good it was not good so here we go by the way in the chat we're not going to talk about it there was a great conversation in the live chat this is why you should join on the live stream about people discussing about why um people and especially women like ar-15 so um the feds just so you know you might want to check out our chat that might be interesting to you <laughs> All right, well, thank you both for both of your arguments. I am going to start with you, Bob, and I'm going to kind of start off where Andrew finished. So my question is, how then do you apply Jesus's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount where he says, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Yeah, excellent question. And I think that is the question for anyone who wants to make a case for uh, the right to bear arms. 
And the, the way the mainstream theological tradition has answered that question is just to say that, uh, that Jesus's ethic there is one that Christians are free to apply personally, but obviously we don't expect countries, nations to apply that ethic in the same way, right? Uh, or to say it the way uh, Frederick Dale Bruner says it, uh, Jesus isn't saying I should let someone slap my neighbor's cheek also. Uh, it's an ethic I'm free to apply personally, but it does not apply to the protection and defense of others. And so uh, though Andrew's certainly correct that the earliest history of the church, the first 300 years, uh, almost across the board, there was a understanding that Christians should not serve in the military, shouldn't, shouldn't use violence in any way. Uh, and so there's maybe some fun conversation we could have about what changed. You know, people want to blame that on Constantine and all of that. But it is interesting to me that the mainstream theological tradition since Augustine would say there's there's freedom here for Christians to uh, that, that Jesus is not intending to uh, undo the Old Testament law related, especially to the protection and defense of others. That's helpful. All right, Andrew, you you did mention you've shot a gun before in, in <laughs> yeah, your arguments. Yeah, you, you've, you've been hunting. Second, what, no, in what context? I'm curious. I was, I was... All right. So what we have just done is we have just decided to do Bible interpretation, everybody, which is fun. We should do Bible interpretation. Um, Pastor Michael, can I give the what I would call the mainstream reformed and I think historic Christian approach to this sermon on the mount that may be helpful to our listeners yep. that is actually yeah, i think that would what be we're really talking helpful. about and then if we have time we can move on so um jesus in the sermon on the mount after he gives the beatitudes after he talks about so jesus wants to make it very clear i am not here to abolish the law now you probably know a yeah. lot of people who interpret the sermon on the mount this way what is jesus doing He's abolishing the law, abolishing the law. <laughs> instituting the law of love or something better, right? He's doing something abolishy at least, yes. right? <laughs> right. And so it's, it's at least abolishy. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, in the, it's in the realm. We're abolishing parts we don't like, right? Um, and so, again, the a fairly – there's – things called new covenant theology obviously dispensational theology says this that like jesus takes to task the 10 commandments and institutes something better right um this is not the belief of reformed christians uh this is not the belief of the majority of the church in church history um and so i actually think the primary problem with this understanding of what it means to turn the other cheek i actually think bob could have given a better answer um, when he says this is something we can choose to do, um, but it's not something we would expect everyone to do. That's it's a very strange answer if Jesus yeah. is giving authoritative moral teaching. Right. right. That's that's very strange. Um, so let me read the verses that take this. And so this comes in the section of the Sermon on the Mount that we call the antitheses. Every single one begins with Jesus saying, you have heard it said. It's said. Yep. But I say to you what I tell you, right? So the actual difficult interpretation that you have to come to to understand all of these statements is what is he talking about they've heard said? Now, some people will say um, you've heard it said refer he's overturning some law, Old Testament teaching they knew. Um, that's not the mainstream opinion. So here is the you have heard it said. He says, Jesus says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. So Jesus is confronting a teaching, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, what, what is he quoting? Now, he is quoting. This is why the view that he's overturning the law actually comes into play. But we must remember, Jesus specifically said, I'm not overturning the law. Yep. He's quoting a penal, a penal code from the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law used proportional punishments for any crime. So if you um, injured someone's eye, you were to lose an eye. If you caused them a hand, you were lost a hand. If you caused their life, as we know, capital punishment, you lost your life. This was in compared to most ancient codes in the day where like, you know, there's the, well, it's the good old Aladdin song that we've now censored out, right? Where we'll cut off your hand if we don't like your face, right? Like there was the, the code of Hammurabi. Like if you stole, we cut off your hand, yep. right? And so there was this. And it was common, right? Somebody 
Okay, you uh, come and you uh, harm me. Okay, I'm just going to kill your whole family. Exactly. Like, that's not an yeah. uncommon practice. There's a lot of vengeance going on. Exactly. A lot of lawlessness in a sense. A full, like, when there was a, when, especially at that point in human history, when we existed in tribes and clans, a slight of almost any kind meant we're going to try and kill every man, woman, and child related to you, right? So the question is, why is Jesus quoting penology to people as their interpersonal life? Well, what it seems like is all of these things, why is he talking about a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees? Yep. It seems like he is confronting the pharisaical interpretation of the law that in that day. Yes. And he's saying, instead of the Pharisees being the really holy people, which is how we interpret them, Jesus is saying they're the people who have degraded the actual teaching yes. of the Bible. A hilarious twist, the opposite of how we think today of what we think they were doing, right? So what it seems like is the Pharisees took this statement of Mosaic penology and said, this is the kind of retaliation you can engage in in your personal life, right? So whenever someone's, you know, you can engage in retaliation as severe as you receive, right? And so Jesus is, is teaching against personal retaliation, teaching against personal vengeance, which they were abusing the mosaic penology to come. Now, this one is actually one of the harder ones to interpret um, because he's actually quoting verses. There are others you can look at that are um, very clearly uh, not what the Bible teaches. But do you want to add anything to that? I just think that that is an imp some important concept. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. We uh, recently um, looked at uh, Matthew 7 and the idea of, of Christ not coming to uh, uh, abolish the law, uh, but to feel it that your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, that um, Christ didn't come as an anarchist. Um, sorry to all you out there who really wanted that, but it simply isn't true. Um, he came to fulfill the law, and fulfill doesn't mean, um, therefore, there's no... Uh, there's nothing for us to learn from it. And we're just moving on from all that stuff because God changed his mind and does things differently. Now, um, things are done different, but because, uh, those shadows have come to their completion, um, not because they were not good, not because, um, God should like, shouldn't have done that, um, which sounds blasphemous even to, to say, uh, mockingly, like I just did, but, uh, like this it's not as though God had said um, it's okay for sometimes to take the life of another um, and then says, you know what? I was wrong about that. Um, I wish I hadn't said that. That's not what's going on when Christ comes onto the scene. Um, Christ is the same God who, who gave these laws. And so you have to reckon with that if you want to actually make sense of the scriptural interpretation on, on uh, the use of force or violence. All right. So we are going to go slightly over because we are going to get to the end of this section, which ends in like two and a half minutes. And it'll just make it an easy place for us to pick up where we record. Great. Maybe we won't get through this whole thing, but we'll get through at least uh, some of the interesting parts. We might not watch the conclusion because, you know, those are never, never the best. So here we go. So I was in the I was in the cadets at school and so we had to fire SA-80s. Uh, it was like a target rangers, that kind of thing. I, I think I used, when I used a hunting rifle, it wasn't, it was the firing of the gun rather than, I haven't actually shot an animal, but I used it, um, I think probably clay pigeon shooting or something like that. I can't remember, I remember where I was. I don't actually remember what, I think it was one of those things where they fire things through the air and so it was a lot of fun. Um, but I've kind of mentioned it because I don't think, it's because I don't know that the, uh, the principle of saying n nothing, no weapon that could be used to kill somebody can ever be owned by anybody. Right which is at a more extreme level is the carving knife baseball bat argument. But I just thought it was worth throwing out because otherwise people think, ah, he's an English guy. What does he know? So that's why I thought I'd throw it out. So Andrew, I, I do really appreciate the way that you make the argument in terms of unacceptable ext extremes. That's what you're, you're, you're getting at there, uh, of what can be used as a weapon and where we would draw those lines. So let's go to your fourth point, which you call your most radical, but it, it had the most Bible. So I think that's a good place to start. Do you think that there is a time for self-defense and if you do, how do you align that with Jesus's command to turn the other cheek? I mean, I, th I think it, de it depends what you mean by yeah, defense, right? So, and I think obviously the word, <laughs> the word defense is very slippery because it goes from, I'm, if, I don't, if I'm not prepared to 
kill somebody, I'm not going to defend them. And I don't think that's true at all. I think there are lots of ways of defending your neighbor, defending your neighbor's reputation, honor, sta literally standing in front of the bullet, standing in front of the tank, whatever it may be. And cr the Christian tradition is obviously full of you know, nonviolent ways of defending people. So as to well me, as I don't think the debate's really about defense. Like that's, mm -hmm. that, that isn't the, the, the terminology I would use because I think the idea of defending your neighbor is a noble thing. And in some circumstances, the idea of defending myself, depending on what it is, I can defend myself against charges of false accusation. I don't think that's wrong. I don't think Jesus is saying don't, in, in that setting. I think the issue with do not resist the one who is evil is I think you have to do a lot of wiggling to try and get out of it. If by that you mean somebody's coming to me and I think that they are going to attack either me or even someone close to me and so I can kill them, I think that's a, a, a very difficult thing to square with don't resist the one who is evil. But I think defending doesn't only have to take violent form. It doesn't have to involve carrying a gun or even any kind of weapon. So that's why I would sort of want to disentangle defense as a word. I think it's, to be honest, I think it's a euphemism mostly for the right to own a gun that might kill someone. I don't, I don't think that's the same as defending something. I think there are lots of ways of defending yourself without violence. And many in the, and you'd say we're just a few hundred yards from the Martin Luther King Memorial. You can defend people as, and he did without using violence. So, to me, those two, two things are quite distinct. So that's probably That's how helpful. I start answering it. All right. Well, that was bad, too. Yeah. Um, so let's just... Um, oh, man. So... <laughs> we we what, knew. We had we, a feeling that this would go this way. So I want to say good question right. to our moderator, G, to Jim. Right? So if G, if Christians can ever defend themselves, how do you square that? Like, if you're going to make this radical claim... If we can defend ourselves at all, if we can resist an evildoer ever, how do you square it, right? Because if you're going to take the absolutist position, well, sorry, like, turning the Jews to the Nazis, right? Like, if there's injustice in society, just say we accept it. That's okay. Um, but, man... It is... Well, I can defend somebody's reputation. <laughs> yeah, I guess you can. Um Right, like, oh, I don't, so. Here's my question. If if it has to be um, completely nonviolent all the time, right? Okay, somebody is attacking somebody that you love. Can you physically restrain yeah. them? That Because that is violence, right? And you can hurt somebody in the midst of doing that if you're really trying to restrain somebody. Yeah. Um, can you tackle them? Uh, can you push them over? Can you tie them up? Can you, like, what? I just, again, what is the limiting principle of what you're saying? Because you if you're going to be consistent, you got to go all the way, man. Right. Like you got to go all the way. And it doesn't sound like you're willing to totally do that. Can you call the police? Right. We're at, we're back to yep. that level again. Now here's the, man, here is the, um, here is the real, the real rub. So when he gives, so he says, uh, the right to self-defense is just a euphemism for the right to own a gun and do these things. Okay. So I mean, like, okay, but, but what he then says is like, cause what we're talking about is you think someone's going to attack you and your family. And so you have the right to shoot and kill them. You've just, again, you've framed the debate in an insane way. Right. Well, this is this is what people want. I want the right to shoot someone if I think they might attack me. Right. If I have a hunch, I'm just going to start going in guns blazing. And do you know what would happen, by the way, here in the United States, no matter how loose your gun laws are, if you did that, you will be in jail for murder or manslaughter. You will be on trial. You will probably not win either. Right. There is there is a law against that. And and this is where the the actual question comes because actual defense i agree there are nonviolent means i agree we should match proportional force i agree we should flee we should avoid violence we should have like i don't i'll just say having spent time with people very into the use of firearms defending themselves there are few people you will ever hear talk about more seriously the idea, the desire to avoid ever killing someone than these people, right? Like the amount of seriousness with which the majority. Now, obviously, there are you can find YouTube videos of morons, right? Um, 
I was just quoted by the other Paul saying, I want the right to shoot someone. So that's uh, that's our Aussie friend, the other Paul, joining the chat quick. But, <laughs> but here's the issue. At some point, here is what ends up applying. Defending yourself takes a lot of different skills in a lot of different forms. And here's here's the thing. At some point, we have to say something comes into an application. If a man fails to provide for his household, he is worse than a non-believer. There is a point where you fail out of cowardice, inaction, negligence, um, foolishness of a way of defending your family that does biblically make you disqualify you from leadership of your household. Yeah. And now, as uh, as Andrew Wilson accuses me of, I'm just saying that means own a gun. Obviously, I'm not. Right? Like, that could involve locks on your doors. That could say, wow, family, we're going to not go this way. We're going to go somewhere else. We're going to, right, do all of these things. I, Yeah, there are a lot of ways. There's a lot of means of deterrence. Um, there's, Like we said before, uh, even within the Old Testament law, uh, there are ways that you don't just start. You don't start with shooting, right? right? You, you don't start that way. Um, that... That's not what anybody is really And arguing. if you are, and again, defense is a skill we learn, just like earning money, just like reading and teaching the Bible. If a gun is a tool, like we've said, if it is a tool, and that is what it is, it is a kind of tool um, that does happen to be incredibly deadly if used in a particular way, like a lot of other tools, like vehicles, like a lot of things, uh, then you need proper training, right? You need to know how to handle it. Uh, or it could be really that's dangerous. True. That's true. Yeah, that's Everybody true. agrees. Um, that's why we do hunter safety. Uh, that's why we have concealed carry classes. That's why people go to gun ranges to practice. That I mean, that's why you do drills. That's what I mean. That's why people learn how to handle their well. It's why they have gun locks and gun safes. Um, it's right. Nobody's saying, "Hey, if I don't like to look in somebody's eye, maybe I should take them out." Right. Nobody's arguing that, at least not. I mean, obviously, there's crazy people out there, but none of us are saying that. And and this nobody's, is why like, nobody within the Christian world. Yeah. And this is why it's it is a such a different thing, right? That Because there is a person who is very unskilled with a firearm, probably someone like me, where that tool would not allow me to further defend myself. Now, someone yeah. might say, Matt, that is a tool you should learn to use. That is a skill you should acquire. And that is a probably a valid idea, right? And that, but this, again, the problem with these arguments that Wilson makes and so many people make is they end up violating a fundamental tenet of, of Christianity, right? They're against capital punishment, right? I, I, I just like, I don't you know have what to be, to be because when you start with the premises that he does, you have to end up with, yep, there's no place that any person should ever take the life of another person for any reason. That just, you can't, you can't get there from script. That's right. Sure. You can't, you can't get there. You can't get there from reason, but you definitely can't get there from scripture. That's right. And so again, if what I want is the conversation I didn't get. So our next live stream, I will not be drinking something to celebrate the UK. That's okay. But we will finish this wonderful debate or maybe not finish it. We did not make it far. We really, we talked about things. I hope this was helpful. I hope we, we did not. Um, but we are going to record. A I had fun. I have fun talking about it with you. Um, sorry to the Aussies in our chat. I did uh, misidentify Andrew Wilson as an Aussie at first when we just heard a couple couple words from him so sorry about that did not mean to lump him in with you guys um that's my bad and and so we will continue to please react. <laughs> please if you somehow got a weapon don't use it against us for just that you know right uh, that was not meant as an attack on your life and so we we will watch at least the back and forth because i really think the back and forth of this debate might be where it's more interesting so we will release that next monday while pastor michael is at the general assembly of the presbyterian church in america and if you will be there 
you should find him. Send us pictures. Please do. Oh, yeah, DM me, um, you know, email us, whatever. And I uh, would love to catch up with anybody that's going to be there. Tell Michael to record a live show there that I can uh, that I can uh, enjoy and watch with all I of will, you. I will not be bringing a mic with me uh, on the plane. So it would be on an iPhone. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's it. I mean, that's it. I mean, it would not be good. It would not be good. Well, everyone, this has been great. We've been going for about an hour and 40 minutes. We are not super Gen Z streamers who can stream for hours. So we will call it. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, congratulations to the guy who won our uh, membership to the Patreon for a little while. And we will catch you next time. Thank you for listening to this entire podcast. Please share this podcast, like, and subscribe to Restless on YouTube. And on their Patreon feed this Monday, they will be reacting to a clip of Mark Driscoll, the human one.